Hey everybody, Gordon has asked me to make another camera review on his channel. Today we're going to be testing the Insta360 GO Mark II. I get to review all of the fun cameras. Let's get into this. The first thing I need to get off my chest, this is made by the company Insta360. It's not a 360 camera. This is the second version. The first version was released in August 2019, but it was limited to filming clips between 30 and 60 seconds, which obviously limits its use in the real world. This new version completely fixes that. This will allow you to film up to 10 minutes or 15 minutes, depending on which mode you're filming in. And of course that opens it up to a much broader audience, very much like a traditional camera. Now I am very worried about dropping this. This camera is tiny. Its form factor is only a few millimeters larger than the original version. And that's probably because they've changed the technology inside this. Now the company's slogan is the tiny mighty action camera. Now that we know that they're putting it in the box of action camera, let's talk about the specs. The original video files coming out of this camera are 2,688 pixels by 2,688 pixels. Yes, that's right. It is producing a square image. More on that in a second. There's a slight drop in resolution once you take into consideration the stabilization. The final exported video is 2,560 pixels by 1440, which is just shy of 2.7K. You've got a lens which is an 11 mm equivalent to a full frame camera and you've got a fixed aperture of f2.2. The camera's got a 32 gigabyte internal memory which equates to 28 gigabytes of usable space uh, but no inputs whatsoever which makes this waterproof up to 4 meters. Now since this is a bit of an unconventional form factor you'll be pleased to know it doesn't matter which way up you film this with and that's because it's creating a square image. Now from that square image which will have a big image circle in the middle and then you'll just have voids in the corners and from there you can export landscape, portraits or square images at various resolutions. Another feature that this square format is allowing is horizon lock which essentially lets you spin the camera in a complete 360 and it's as if the camera doesn't move at all because it's shuffling around all of the pixels and it's just keeping your final export within that image circle. Continuing the theme of using the pro mode this also allows you to recompose your video after you've shot it. Because it's got that square image again, and if you're exporting it a landscape, it allows you to essentially tilt your camera down or up in editing afterwards. And you can do that on the phone app, or you can do it on their dedicated studio desktop app. A practical use of this recomposing feature is I could shoot one video, I can export it in landscape for YouTube. I could then export it in portrait and post that to Instagram. And then you don't have to start cropping it in video editing software afterwards. And you can avoid awkward black bars along the side or the top because you've started with something which wasn't actually catered to the platform. If you shoot in standard video mode, then it will simply export at the settings that you had it in camera. So if you shot it in landscape, you can only export it in landscape. One final thought on which video mode you should use with this camera. You've got standard mode and you've got pro mode. Now, you've still got to get your video files off this device somehow, which means either physically connecting it to your computer or via Wi-Fi to your phone via the app, at which point you might as well shoot in pro mode. It gives you a lot more flexibility. Uh, as you can see here from this overlay, the left-hand side, you've got the standard stabilization and on the right-hand side, you've got the pro stabilization. The pro stabilization is better. There's no doubt about it. Although the standard stabilization is still very watchable. The only downside to shooting pro is the file sizes are slightly larger. For one minute of standard video, you're talking about 450 megabytes and the pro mode is around 600 megabytes per minute. Otherwise, shoot in pro mode. Now the camera shoots a variety of different frame rates. You've got 24, 25, 30, 50, and 120 frames per second. But at the moment, they're scattered over different modes. I'm told, however, that that's going to be fixed in a future update. You've also got digital lenses from wide to narrow to linear, but if you shoot in pro mode, you can fix that in editing afterwards. So I've just shoot in pro mode. This video is being filmed and edited in 4K. The Go 2 shoots in 2.7K, therefore that footage is being upscaled to meet the video of 4K. Just a bit of housekeeping, this is a pre-production model that I'm testing here and it's running the firmware version 3.5.1. Right, uh, it is particularly windy so I'm filming the audio on my camera here and uh, the video is actually coming straight from the Insta360 Go 2. This is uh, quite a challenging scene perhaps it's very contrasty, it's overcast, yet I'm surrounded by really, really dark um, background with the underside of this bridge. So let me go under here. 
I think we can agree that it's not really necessary to have the camera on the end of a selfie stick. This is already quite wide. This is me at full arm's length and I've reviewed some of the videos and you can see too much of my arm so it's a bit obnoxious. Here, a very relaxed position. Still really wide angle lens. You can still see loads of my uh, surroundings and context and everything so whoa! That was a close call. Right, the sun has gone in, but I thought I'd take this opportunity because this is a really high dynamic contrasty scene. So this is a good opportunity to try out the HDR mode and see if it's any better than the regular or the pro mode. My first observation is that the HDR mode has got a lot less color in it. Secondly, I think it's actually got less detail in the sky, which is the opposite of what I thought was going to happen. And even though both of these clips were filmed on the mini tripod on that still beam I nearly just hit myself on, the camera seems to be slowly rotating. Not entirely happy with that test, I thought I would give it another go, this time on Brighton Seafront in a bright sunny condition. And I think you can see here, we've got a very similar desaturated look, but this time you can actually see the benefit. If you have a look at the pier, there's a lot more detail on the HDR video, although you're gonna have to edit it a lot more than the standard or the pro mode. The time-lapse feature is very easy to set up. You don't have to worry about settings, focus. You just set the interval between the images and you're off. The hyperlapse feature, or time shift as they call it, has absolutely no settings when you capture it. You just press record and you make all of the decisions in the app after you've shot it, which I think is good. You can change the speed anywhere from a quarter speed to 64 times faster. You can add motion blur, enable stabilization. You can change the digital lenses as well as add filters and effects. At the other end of the spectrum, this captures slow motion at 120 frames per second. This has been slowed down to suit a 25p timeline, but note this is lowered to 1920, which is full HD. This camera also takes photographs at 9 megapixels, which is 3000 by 3000, because it's capturing a square image again. Now they are not JPEGs in camera, they are .insp, which is Insta360 panoramic image, and that allows you to recompose the image afterwards, but that does drop it down to 1920 by 1080 resolution. Now the camera works on its own. You don't need any accessories for this to work. Now there is no screen, okay? but the lens on it is so wide you can be very confident that you're both in focus and in frame. It is so wide. In order to start recording you just squeeze the button on the front, it will vibrate and you get a flashing blue icon on the front. Press it once more and it will stop recording. It's as simple as that. If you want a bit more control then you'll be pleased to hear that this has got built-in Wi-Fi. You can connect it to your phone, you can now control all of the settings, you can see what you're recording and you can also edit the video footage. What I would highly recommend you do is go into the settings on the app and customize. For example, I've been using pro video mode the most. You can customize it so you press it once and it will go into pro mode and it'll start recording. You can customize it so if you press twice, it will take a photograph, whatever you want. But without connecting it to the phone via the app or using the controller, which we'll talk about in a second, just customize it so that you can just use that on its own. Now the original Go had a charging case, but it was very basic and to get the files off the original Go, you had to physically plug it into your phone. The new version is a massive improvement. Okay, let's start off with, we'll open it up inside. You'll see instantly it's got two buttons here. This is your mode button and then this is your stop and start button. You've got a tiny screen on here which gives you all of the minimal but very necessary information. Recording time, battery life, how much storage is left on the memory card. Really clever, these two things connect together via Bluetooth. So let's just say you don't have a mobile phone whatsoever. These two things here will allow you to record video, take photographs, and this tiny screen here, and this charging case is everything you need in order to create the footage. The only thing you can't do is review the video back. It's got a magnetic receiving inside, so I'll just chuck that in there and you can see it snaps into place. If I close it and turn it around, you'll see it's got a tripod thread in the bottom. It's got USB-C port, which gives you charging and data transfer capabilities. There's a tiny hole in the top of it, which is actually for the microphone, which is positioned in exactly the same place on the inside. Flip it over and it's got these tiny little tripod legs, which might seem a bit ridiculous. However, if you're indoors, that sits nicely on a table. This is perfect. This is serving so many purposes. And let's not forget that it's actually a charging case. The camera on its own has got about 30 minutes battery life 
and the charging case has got about two hours. So if you were to put the camera in there, it's supposed to achieve two and a half hours um, of battery life. I haven't tested that two and a half hour battery life because the video clips are actually limited to 10 and 15 minute clips at a time. The camera itself will charge in half an hour and the charging case will charge in an hour. One final thing on the battery life, the internal storage capacity holds about 45 minutes worth of video. You will fill up the internal memory before the batteries will go flat. If you're an Apple fanboy like me, then these are EarPods case, and this is the Insta360. Not too dissimilar, they're a tiny bit smaller. And even though the Insta360 Go 2 is much smaller than a GoPro Hero 9, once you take into account the carry case, I'd say they're not too far apart. The creators at Insta360 are pitching this as an action camera. So obviously everyone's going to want to know how it compares to a GoPro, but I can do better than that. I've got some side-by-side -side comparisons of what I think are its closest competitors. Well, the cameras that I could get hold of. Anyway, I've got the iPhone 11 Pro, I've got the GoPro Hero 8, the GoPro Hero 9, and also the DJI Pocket 2. Let's see how it compares. To make this test as fair as possible, everything here is shooting in 2.7K with the exception of the iPhone which is in 4K because they don't offer 2.7K. First of all, we are looking at image quality. I've taken a still image from that video clip. This is an indoor situation, but it is well lit. The Pocket 2 seems to be winning this, but that's expected. It does have the largest sensor, closely followed by the iPhone 11 and the Insta360, both producing great looking images. In comparison, the GoPro is looking a bit soft. It's not handling 2.7K very well at all. When it comes to stabilization, walking with your camera, the DJI Pocket 2 has the most natural results, but that's because it's a gimbal. But surprisingly, I think the iPhone's got the best level of stabilization here. It seems to have smoothed out the footsteps, the up and down movement, closely followed by the Insta360 and the DJI Pocket. And in last place, my GoPro Hero 8 it looks almost out of focus. It's just soft. It wants to be in 4K rather than 2.7K. I have managed to get my hands on a GoPro Hero 9 since that first video. So what you've got here is the GoPro Hero 9 on that side and the Insta360 on that side. They're both on the same settings as far as I can get them. GoPro is on 4K 50 frames per second, Insta 2.7K 50 frames per second. Uh, the Insta is shooting in pro mode, so that's its best level of stabilization. I'm hiding behind a hedge here because it's a bit windy. Um, so if you're interested in what the audio sounds like directly from these cameras, this is the audio coming from the GoPro Hero 9, and this is the audio coming from the Insta360 Go 2. Both of the cameras were on a chest mount here and when you go for a casual walk, there's not much in it. They both look great. Next, I went for a gentle run and you can see here, the GoPro's handling that rapid movement a lot better. Perhaps the most important test for an action camera, how does it handle extreme sports? Once again, these were mounted on the same chest mount, same settings, and you can see here that the GoPro, the mighty GoPro stabilization is handling this situation much better. The image is crisper and uh, it's just buttery smooth. They've set the bar really high when it comes to stabilization. Insta360 are also targeting vloggers with this new camera, so is it any good? At the moment, I'm shooting in pro mode. The audio I'm recording separately on my Canon here, but if I now switch to the audio, this is the audio from the Insta360. It's inside the carry case. I take you out of the carry case. There is a light breeze right now and there's an airplane flying over the top. So this is what the audio sounds like outside of the case. This is what the audio sounds like inside the case and there is a light breeze, okay? Now, I don't know if it's possible because this camera has got built-in Wi-Fi. If they could do the same as the DJI Pocket 2 and have a wireless microphone, that would solve this issue. If they were to be able to do that, then this becomes a very interesting vlogging option. If you only ever shoot videos indoors, you've got good natural daylight and you've got good acoustics in your room. This room does not have good acoustics. I've got some panels on the wall, but that's probably not going to salvage this situation. Then this camera could work for you and you don't need very much space at all. I can literally touch it from where I'm sitting. The thing that excites me the most about this camera is the fact that it's magnetic. So you don't have to go out with the tripod and I've just attached it to a lamppost. If you go out with a small camera without a tripod, you're normally limited to being very, very low down onto the ground. With this, it's magnetic. So you find something metal and now all of a sudden you've got an eye level composition. 
The carricase charger is not the only accessory that's magnetic. Inside the box you're going to get the pendant, which is quite simply, it's a necklace, wraps around you, you tuck it underneath your t-shirt or your jumper, and then it just magnetizes to the front of you. If you're doing something that's a bit more high impact, you'll need to use one of the other accessories because they encase the camera as well as being magnetic. The whole time that I've been using this camera, I've just left it on automatic mode. Now you can go into manual mode, you can't control the aperture because that is fixed at f2.2. You can control ISO, white balance, shutter speed, frame rate. There are some things that you can control, but in my opinion, a small fun device like this shouldn't be taken too seriously. So just enjoy it, leave the camera to do all the hard work and just leave it on automatic mode. Now as somebody who creates YouTube videos around landscape photography, I thought I would take it out with me and see how it copes. Now, that day was particularly windy. The audio was completely unusable. I expected that. Before the sun came up, as you can see from this video here, the stabilization was really struggling. The footage looks a bit jittery. But as soon as the sun came up, the image was nice and crisp. Stabilization worked absolutely fine. So you've got to pick your conditions to use this camera. Oh, it's cold, it's cold, it's cold. Okay, let's wrap up this video, shall we? Insta360 created a unique camera back in 2019, and this second version improves upon it in every way. I can see this camera really appealing to people that just want to be free of holding their phone out in front of them, they want their hands back, nothing in between them and the experience. I think this would also work really well for content creators such as myself for recording behind the scenes when you haven't got a spare hand to hold another camera and you just want that first person perspective. It's small, it's got great stabilization, no complicated settings, it's magnetic, and of course, it's fun to use. Now, I've lived with the GoPro ecosystem of mounts and fittings for years now, and I have to say, it's absolutely liberating to be able to just do that with a magnetic attachment. To do that with the GoPro, you're talking about untwisting it, and you're still wearing a harness, essentially. It's not the same experience. First world problems, it takes 30 seconds to put a GoPro on and off a chest mount. But what we're talking about is one second to go from, I'm making a video about myself, to I need my hands to be free now and film what I'm doing. Now, as you've seen throughout this entire video when I'm doing side-by-side -side comparisons, I'm genuinely surprised at the quality of the video coming out of this tiny device. The 2.7K is certainly keeping up with the 4K of other devices. And I personally think that the colors coming out of the Go2 are much better than that of the GoPro especially around skin tones. The stabilization on the Go 2 is perfect for everyday use, but when it comes to high impact sports, the GoPro is the winner on that one. And my final point is about the audio. The Go 2 has only got one microphone. The GoPro has got the advantage of having multiple microphones and then it can handle wind noise a little bit better. The Go 2 is going to be released in March 2021 and it's going to be priced around 295 pounds. Gordon, I'm just making this review of the Insta360 GO 2. Do you want to be in the video? Maybe you could tell people to like and subscribe. Ben, it's your video. They're here to see you. You're the expert on this, not me. Right. Yeah, but you, do like and subscribe. More Ben, please. Yeah, more Ben, please. If you like this video, smash the like button. Make sure you subscribe to Gordon's channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.